starting the recording of this it just started uh, the recording of this uh, lecture this is our second lecture today on who we are in christ bc 110 uh, welcome back everyone um, any questions uh, before we start off a new section we're going to go into a new section now um, any questions on the old I think okay. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen. We're going to look at the PDF. And uh, so this PDF has been shared with you in uh, the cl uh, classwork section in the Google Classroom. Um, so we're moving into a new section. So what we're going to do as we journey through the course now, is to kind of drill down into various aspects of our identity in Christ, right? So uh, in the second section, when we talked about the new creation, we looked at, in general, okay, this is what we say about the new creation. And we are supposed to live out of that um, identity and inheritance and life that we have in Christ. So in general, the new creation is a term that covers every aspect of who we are in Christ. But what we want to do now is kind of drill down into specific individual aspects of who we are in Christ and try to understand it and uh, see how that, you know, how we apply that in our personal lives. That's what we're going to do as we journey in. Uh, and there is a lot, there is a lot that the Bible tells us. So the first thing we're going to look at is the fact that we have been justified and made righteous in the eyes of God. Now, you know, many believers, many believers struggle with the sense of uh, guilt, shame, and condemnation, and unworthiness before God. That means when we come to God, oh, we always say, God, I'm such an unworthy sinner. I'm so useless. Now, it is true that God is infinitely greater than us, but we must relate to God how he wants us to relate to him. And what has he said? And we're going to discover from the scriptures that God is saying, look, you were unworthy, you were guilty, you were full of shame and condemnation. That's how you were. But now in Christ, I have made you righteous. To be righteous means I've made you in right standing before me. So I want you to relate to me, to relate to God on the basis of who God himself has made us to be in Christ. So what God is saying is don't come and talk to me as though you're an unworthy, guilty person. Talk to me as who I made you to be in Christ. Relate to me on that basis. And so when we understand that as we go through the scriptures and understand that, you know, God wants us to come to him without any sense of guilt, shame and condemnation and, uh, uh, and relate to him freely. It's going to change how we pray. It's going to change how we think or think of who God is and how, what is our relationship with him. It's going to change that completely. So let's get into the scriptures. What we must understand, and we have seen this earlier in Ephesians. We'll read it again. Can somebody read Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 for us, please? It's there uh, in the PDF. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Mm, thank you. So he's telling us that God chose us in him. So in him, that's in Christ. Now that's, that's, that's what we've been, uh, what we are looking at in Christ. So God chose us in Christ. 
before the foundation of the world. That means even before he created anything, God decided, you know, I'm going to have all of these people in, in Christ. So he's, God decided, I'm going to have all these people in Christ. And in Christ, these people are going to be holy. And we will talk about that in the next section. But we're going to focus on this. And without blame before him. Without blame before him. So God decided, even before he created everything, he said, I'm going to have a people who are going to be in Christ, which is you and me, we are in Christ. And we are going to be without blame before him in love. That means covered because of his love. So this is the truth. You are without blame before him. Without blame. You know, the word without blame, I mean, just, you know, if you want to use some synonyms, synonyms for that, it simply means you are faultless. God doesn't look at you and say, ah, you've got all these faults in your life. You are blameless or unblameable, without blemish, without spot. This is how God sees us. So when you stand before God, how does God see you? He sees you without blame. So who said that? Well, the scripture said that. Ephesians 1.4. The scripture said that that's what God intended to do even before the foundation of the world. That everyone who is in Christ will stand before him without blame. So right now, when God looks at you, because you are in Christ, you are without blame before him. So, we must understand, this is how God sees me. Now, we may be very accustomed to having been told that God sees you as a filthy sinner, that God sees you with all your flaws and faults, but we need to change that thinking and say, hey, the scriptures are telling me that because I am in Christ, I am without blame before him. Now, this is not to say that, you know, we don't sin. Uh, we will be dealing with that a little later. Of course, when we do sin, we have to say, God, I'm sorry, what I did is wrong. I'm not condoning sin. What I'm saying is, because we are in Christ, we are without blame. And that's how God sees us. Right? Or uh, we could also... The same truth is repeated again in Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. Could somebody read this for us, please? Go ahead. Colossians 1, 20 to 22. Okay, what happened to the class? And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Mm. So thank you. So it's telling us, you know, through what Jesus did for us on the cross, what has been now, what is possible? We are holy. We will talk about it in the next section. And we are blameless and above reproach in his sight. Just think, look at that. Blameless. It's matching here. You know, what he told us in Ephesians, we are blameless. He's repeating here again. We are blameless and above reproach. That means beyond even uh, any fault in God's sight. That's happened because of the cross, because of what Jesus did to the blood of his cross. Because Jesus paid for every sin. The outcome is today, you and I are blameless and above reproach 
in the eyes of God, right? That means to be above reproach simply means to be unaccused, to be uh, innocent, to be uh, unimpeachable, without anything that would make us guilty before God, without charge. Right? So begin to see yourself like that. You know, this is how I am in God's eyes. Not because I, I achieved this. No. It's because Jesus, through the blood of his cross, has made it possible for me. And because I am in Christ, this is how I am in the eyes of God. Now, to add to this, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Somebody could read this, please. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Thank you. He says, he has made us accepted. We are accepted in the beloved. The beloved, of course, is Jesus Christ himself. So in Christ, who are you? You are accepted. You're already, he made us accepted. He made us accept it. That means he's already done this for us and he's the one who did it for us. We are not trying to you know, achieve it through some way of life. No, he's already made us accept it in Christ. And so the word accept it simply means uh, to grant special honor, to be highly favored, to be uh, covered with grace, to be surrounded with favor, to be honored with blessings. So when God is saying, look, I have accepted you in Christ, he's saying, look, I have given you honor. I've said you're highly favored. I've said you're covered with my grace. You're surrounded with my favor. You're honored with my blessings. You know? And the Bible is saying you, you are accepted in the beloved. And so if we are accepted, then we are not striving for acceptance. So some believers, they're always striving to be accepted by God. Or today I have to pray two hours and uh, I have to read my Bible so much, only then God will be happy with me. They're having that kind of a mentality. They are striving to be accepted. But the Bible is saying he has made us accepted in Christ. He's already done it. So we must learn to live out of that. God has already accepted me. I am accepted by God. And if I read my Bible, I'm doing it not in order to gain acceptance, but just to know that I have been accepted. I enjoy reading the Bible. If I pray for two hours, I'm not praying in order to be accepted. I am playing, praying from a place of having been accepted. I'm just enjoying the fact that I can spend two hours in prayer with God. So the whole approach to prayer, the whole approach to the word of God has changed. I'm not doing any of these things to be accepted, but I'm doing it because I have been accepted. I enjoy it now. I'm in a place of honor, favor, grace, blessing. And hey, I'm just enjoying the word of God. I'm enjoying spending time with God. Right? You will always go back to a place where you are accepted. It will draw you back and you know that you are so welcomed in God's presence. So that's why you do it, right? So understand you are accepted in Christ. You're already accepted by God. And it's, it's perfectly fine. You know, from time to time, you just need to affirm uh, boldly before God and for yourself. You know, Father, I thank you that in Christ, I have a special honor. I'm highly favored. Now I'm covered with your grace. I'm surrounded with favor. I'm honored with your blessings. I'm an object of your grace. You know, to say that often, just to affirm that, because that's the truth. That's the word of God. Right? So we need to move from the thinking that we are hated to knowing that we are loved by God in Christ. Move from thinking you're accused to embracing the truth that you, you are accepted by God in Christ. 
from being shamed to knowing that in Christ you're honored. So you don't have to feel ashamed before God. You go before God as someone who has been honored by God. You don't have to feel condemned before God. You go before him because in Christ you are favored. So you go before him. Father, thank you. I'm loved, I'm accepted, I'm honored, I'm favored in your eyes. As your son, as your daughter. So you begin to pray, you begin to engage with God on like that. Right? So now, you see many of us uh, have been, you know, because of religion. So religion, uh, or I would, you know, religion means uh, just the way things have been done. Uh, they, 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 it thrives on self-condemnation. It thrives on putting a sense of guilt, shame, and condemnation on people, because then that makes us feel like we are in need. The moment you tell somebody, "Hey, you are you are forgiven. You are righteous. You are accepted." There is no more need there. So then, why should people come, you know, to church? You know, or why people don't need that? But because of religion, there's the sense of strong sense of self self condemnation, guilt, shame, guilt and shame. And so we need to just come out of it and say, God, today I'm accepting what your word says. I am loved, I'm favored, I'm honored, I am accepted, and I've been graced by God. I've been blessed by God. Right? And in this place of of knowing that you know we are accepted by God, we find our sense of significance, security, and self worth. So you know, psychologists will tell us these are the three big needs, emotional needs of a human person: uh, a sense of significance, security, and self worth. So the three big emotional needs everyone, all of us have as human beings. We want significance, you know, we desire for significance. My life counts, means, you know, counts something here or not. Uh, security, that, you know, I, I know I'm going to be secure and self-worth, that means uh, I am worth something. But the best place to find our sense of significance, security and self-worth, find it in God because you are accepted in the beloved. God, I am accepted, completely accepted in Christ. So all my significance, all my security, all my self-worth is right there in the beloved, in Christ. And so I don't have to look for it in other places. Now, in the natural, you may achieve a lot, and it gives you, you know, some amount of significance. But that is fine. But you're not dependent on it. Or, you know, uh, you may be very successful and uh, have a lot of money. That's good. It's not nothing wrong with it. But money doesn't become our security. Our security is always in God. Uh, or, you know, people may say a lot of good things about us and it makes us, you know, we have a lot of self worth. But that doesn't is not the basis of our self worth. Our self-worth is deeply rooted in Christ. So then these externals, you know, they are there. We are not living by it. We enjoy it, but we're not dependent on those things. Okay. Now, again, here's a very, very, you know, we are adding to this truth about, uh, let me see a thing. Maybe there's a question on the chat. Um, okay. Shani, you have a question, please go ahead. Oh yeah, I have a question. I know you're saying when you're a new creation Christ, you don't have to worry about any kind of shame, but what if you do something and you feel shame? How do you kind of get over that since you know, you're know you a new creation now and there's no more shame? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So all of us, will do something wrong, you know, maybe still living in this world and uh, we're still struggling with our soul and our body and, you know, we will do things wrong. Uh, so what do we do at that moment? The Bible tells us, and I, I am uh, referencing 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. 1 John um, 
chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. And then we will look at this a little later as well. When I do something wrong, I shouldn't pretend that I haven't done it. I should accept it. And the Bible tells us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all he tells us to do is look. Just come and confess it to God. Just say, Father, I know I, I, I did something or I said something or I behaved in some way that is not right. I'm sorry about it. Please forgive me. That moment, just that simple prayer, I've confessed, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he will cleanse us from all. She says, yeah. Now, why can God do that? Because, uh, you know, John goes on, First John chapter 2, verse 12, he says, my little children, your sins are forgiven you because of his name's sake. That means in First John 2, 12, it says, your sins are forgiven you because of Jesus. Right? So the moment we confess and say, Father, we are sorry. I'm sorry at whatever I did. I, I know it's wrong. Our sins are forgiven. Why? Because of Jesus. Jesus paid for it and he, he already addressed it. So this is how we do it. And then we ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, uh, help me to overcome that. You know, maybe it was my short temper, my irritability or uh, my prejudice or whatever. You know, we all have we, we all struggle with all these things in life. So Holy Spirit, please help me overcome that. Help me to get over that flaw so that I can reveal Christ in my life. And he will do that. And then we are being changed from glory to glory. We begin to reveal Jesus. So in areas where, you know, people would see us make mistakes and, you know, do things wrong. It's so like, wow, no, that person is not doing that, you know. There's a change. What has happened? The new man is being put on. People are seeing that on the outside. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Let's take Divya's question. There's a phrase, put on the new man in Ephesians 4.24, referred to this blamelessness before God. Um, so actually, Divya, the putting on of the new man we can look at it as express outwardly who you are inside, right? It means you are a new person on the inside, express it outside, and it is for the benefit of people, the people around us, for them to see, right? God already knows we are a new man. God already knows we are new. And of course, he wants us to walk in that new creation we are. Right? But when it says put on the new man, uh, every aspect of the new man, including righteousness, including this aspect of being blameless before God, and every other aspect of who we are in Christ, he's saying express it on the outside so people can see how we live. Right? So put on the new man is every aspect of it, including blameless before God, being the fact that we are righteousness before God. And we'll talk about it later, you know, what that means in everyday life. Okay. Okay, okay, Pastor. So that uh, inward uh, knowledge and revelation of my position in Jesus Christ enables me to express outwardly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. As you live by it, you know, people will see. So people see the new creation. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Welcome. So I'm going to go back to the PDF and we will move forward in that. All right. So here's a very interesting passage. Um, could somebody read this for us, please? First Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, 
nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor coaches, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortionists will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Mm, thank you. So, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, the believers at this place called Corinth. Now, Corinth, uh, and this was around, uh, you know, uh, around the AD, AD uh, 50s, 50s, AD 60, that's somewhere around that time. So Corinth at that time was, you know, what we would call as a sin city. It is very, very sinful city. But a lot of these people, when Paul had gone and preached and Paul and his team, when they'd gone and preached, a lot of these people came to faith in Christ. So they came from very, you know, sinful backgrounds. So Paul is addressing that. He says, you know, of, you know, we know the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom. And he says, yeah, uh, you know, they were fornicators, idolaters. He gives all this full list. And he says, such were some of you. So he says, look, some of, some of you, he says, I know. I know that some of the people there, the believers there at Corinth, uh, they came from this kind of background. Because, you know, obviously people there, they had all kinds of things going on. He says, such were some of you. That is your past. You were in that. But something has happened. You were washed. You were sanctified. And you were justified. So look at that. He's saying that was your past, but something happened. You were washed. So the washing means all the dirt. You can imagine, you know, all the dirt and the filth is gone. It's taken off. You were sanctified. And we will look at this in the next section when we study. Sanctified means to be made holy, to set up, be set apart for God. So you were sanctified. But you were justified. That's what we are studying now. The word justified simply means to be, the word justified and the word righteous, they come from the same Greek word. So they're actually synonymous. So in English, we have two different words, justified and righteous, or justification and righteousness. And in English, these are different words. But in the Greek, it's the same, exact same word. The, you know, it's a noun or the verb or a, a adjective, but it's the same word that is translated justified or righteous. So to be justified simply means to be made righteous. Righteous means to be right, to have right standing, to be in right standing, to be justified in the name. That means, see, you were like this. You know, you had all these things in the past going on. But now you are justified. Now you are in right standing with God. You are right in his sight. You are just as if you never sinned. Somebody um, came up with that a long time ago. So justified means to be made just as if you never sinned. You are justified. You are made right in God's eyes. You are righteous in God's eyes. How? In the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. God did it for you. So as a believer, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and we all would have done all kinds of things in the past, but that's past. That's how we were. But something happened to us. What happened to us? We were washed. We were sanctified. We were justified. And we are focusing on this justified part. We have been justified. We have been made right in the eyes of God. We have been made just as if we never sinned. So none of this has any bearing on who I am today. You know, it doesn't say, well, if I, you know, well, I'm still one, of, you know, and I, uh, 
uh, an idolater or whatever. No, I'm not that justified. That's no lo that, that no longer has any bearing on my life today, right? So, um, and justified, we've been made just as if we never sinned. And I kind of just explain, you know, this this whole fact that justified and made righteous, it means the same thing. We are made right in the eyes of God. And this truth is repeated for us in many places, that we are the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. We are the righteousness of God. So let's read some scriptures and, and we will uh, uh, discuss them, right? So uh, could somebody read Romans 3.22 for us, please? It's on the PDF. Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Hmm. Thank you. So think about this. The righteousness of God. What are we talking about? We're talking about the righteousness of God. Through faith. So this is through faith in Jesus. It's to all, oh, let me put it, it is to all, and it is on all who believe. So if you imagine this, if you think about God, and God, if you just imagine in your mind, using our imagination, if you see God having a white robe, pure white, righteous, that means he's blameless. We can't find any fault because he's a righteous God. He's pure white robe. Now that white robe, he takes and he puts it, gives it to you and he puts it on you. Why? Because you have faith in Jesus Christ and you believe. There is no difference. That means regardless of who we are, you know, which part of the world we are from, regardless of our background, regardless of anything, nothing. There's no difference. For everyone who has faith in Jesus, who believes, God has given his white robe of righteousness to every person. And he's put it on every person. So you think about this. The same white robe that God is wearing, he says, the righteousness of God, the blamelessness of God, the uh, you know the absolute perfection of God, the righteousness of God, has been given to every believer, and it's on every believer. So, what what are you wearing? You are clothed right now, right now. You are clothed with the righteousness of God. Because this scripture is saying that the righteousness of God has been given to every person, is on every person who believes in Jesus Christ. There's no difference. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, please. Somebody could read that for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we're talking about righteousness. Righteousness means to be in right standing, to be blameless. And the Bible says here, but of him, it is because of God, you are in Christ Jesus. So we are in Christ. We're talking about that. You are in Christ. Now, because you're in Christ, what has happened? Christ has become for us. So Christ has become to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. We will see these things later. We focus on just one righteousness. So God has brought us into Christ and Christ has become for us righteousness. So who is your righteousness? 
Jesus. Be our standing before God is the same standing that Christ has because Christ is our righteousness. Think about it. Christ is our righteousness. So when you stand before God, you have the same standing before the throne, before the Father, as the Son of God himself. Because the Son of God, Christ Jesus, is our righteousness. So same standing. Now it's, it's like, whoa, this is too much for my mind to grasp. But that's what the scriptures are saying. And so we say, okay, God, I accept it. And I'm going to begin to live out of this blessing you've given to me. I didn't deserve it. None of us deserved it. Uh, it happened because Jesus paid for it on the cross. And we just believed. That's all. So 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Somebody could read this verse for us, please. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Mm, thank you. So the one who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us on the cross. Now, why did he do that? Of course, he paid for the, the penalty for our sin, but there's a whole lot more. This verse is saying he became sin for us so that we might become something. So you have become something. What is it? We have become the righteousness of God. We have become the righteousness of God in him. That means in Christ. So once again, this is talking about who we are in him, in Christ. So in Christ, what has happened? We have become, it's already done. We have become the righteousness of God. Now, what is the scripture saying? We have become the righteousness of God. Like we said earlier, God is absolutely righteous, meaning blameless. And the Bible is saying, in Christ, that same righteousness has been imparted to us, to us and on us. You see, God is righteous, absolutely blameless. The only way he can have relationship with another being is that if that other being is also absolutely blameless. He can't, God is light, he can't have relationship with darkness. And so for God to have relationship with us, the only way he can have relationship with us is if we are as blameless as he. And the only way we can become as blameless as he is by God doing it for us. God made us to become the righteousness of God in Christ. So now God is saying, look, I'll put upon you my blamelessness, my righteousness, I'm giving it to you. So we'll have fellowship. You can be my son and daughter. And you don't have to worry because I've given you my righteousness. So this is what we must understand, that we are sharing the righteousness of God. That means what's on God is on you. We are sharing that same righteousness not some second hand, not some lower righteousness, nothing. Same, the righteousness of God is given it to us. So that's who you are in the spirit. Spiritually, you are the righteousness of God. You are blameless in the eyes of God. You are accepted. You are without blame. Right? So this is what qualifies us to have fellowship with God. See, God cannot have communion or intimate friendship with anything that's not on par with his own righteousness. So the only reason we can have fellowship with God is because he gave us his righteousness and we can come in freely before his presence. So 
righteousness, now the word righteousness, you know, it includes these three things, which is right standing before God, the right nature, God's righteous nature, the nature that tends to do what is blameless or what is right, and also right behavior. So righteousness in the New Testament includes all this, right standing, right nature, right behavior. And we will see, you know, how to live out of it. So the righteousness of God eventually results also in right behavior. And we will talk about that. So righteousness doesn't mean I can go and do anything sinful and just keep on doing things sinful. No, righteousness leads me to right behavior. And we will, we will uh, uh, look at that later. All right. So this happened through faith. So uh, like we have emphasized, it was just simple faith that we had in God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, through which we became justified and righteous. Now, we already read this verse, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith, right? So just we just believed and God said, I'll make you righteous, right? And we see this once again in Romans 5, 1 and 2. Could somebody read this for us, please? Romans 5, 1 to 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have the access by faith into His grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Thank you. So, it says we have been justified or made righteous. So, remember the word justified and made righteous. They're the same words in the Greek. So it says we have been made righteous or we have been justified. How? By faith. By faith. Or here we saw it was through faith. That means all we did was believe. That was the only thing we did. And God said, I'll justify you. And what is the outcome? We have peace with God. So because we are righteous, we have peace with God. That means... We are not fighting with God. Uh, God is not angry with us. God is not mad at us. We are peace. So what's your relationship with God? Very peaceful. We are on good terms. We are on talking terms. We are friends. In fact, it's a very close relationship. Why? Because we have been justified by faith and God made us righteous by faith. So we can have peace with God. God is not looking at my faults, or I'm not afraid that God is going to look at my faults. No, we have a good relationship. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's our relationship with God. We have peace with God. And it also says that through Jesus, we have access, or we come into this by faith. We have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So, because we have been justified by faith and through Jesus, by faith, we are in a place of grace, in this grace in which we stand. You are standing or you are positioned before God in a place of grace. That I means God's favor. So, because we've been made righteous or justified, we have peace with God, good relationship. And not only that, we are highly favored. We are in position in a place of grace. We, have, we are highly favored of God. And because of that, we can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice, we are joyful. We are really, you know, we're joyful because we have hope of the glory of God, even more of what God is going to give us. But right now, we have been justified, made righteous. Therefore, we have peace with God and we are in this grace in which we stand. We are in a place of grace. We are standing in a place of grace because we've been justified. And all happened just through faith, right? 
and you know Paul is uh, telling us that this righteousness is not his own but it's not from the law it's not by doing keeping the law but it is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith so you know Paul affirms once again that you know his righteous the righteousness he has is what God has given to us through faith and that's how we live we live out of that so we are righteous we have been justified and made righteous by his by faith it's we been it's given to us freely by grace right so romans 3:24 says we are justified freely by his grace so we have been justified or made righteous freely by his grace because of the redemption the work of redemption that jesus has done that's in christ jesus so it's by faith it's really by grace so i don't have to work for it i don't have to earn it i don't have to prove myself for it i don't have to pay for it no it's freely by grace it says you're freely by his grace so this justification is freely by grace okay so i'm going to pause here and i know it's been a lot i will pick this up next week uh, and we'll complete this whole aspect of righteousness and talk about how you know we uh, have to live out of that and what it means for us right so understand this is your stand you know your position before god you are justified and you are righteous you're accepted this us so your uh you're completely welcome in god's presence i know you know we just have four more minutes let me try to answer some questions here in the chat elisha is god made him share our sin is it the sinful nature fallen nature that christ was made to share with okay so uh elisha uh, uh when jesus died on the cross a lot was put upon him so our sin was put upon him that's what second corinthians 5:21 says he was without sin yet our sin was put upon him but the bible also says and we will see this in romans chapter 6 and verse 6 that our old man which is the sinful nature the old adamic nature the old sinful nature was crucified with him so when christ was crucified that old sinful nature was also crucified so to answer your question both happened our sins that means the wrong doings that was put upon christ so he became our sin bearer our sinful nature was also crucified with christ so that also was nailed to the cross now that didn't change who jesus was jesus all on the cross was still the sinless spotless lamb of god it didn't change his nature his nature was divine he was deity all the time but deity was bearing the sins of humanity so in what sense did he become sin it doesn't mean deity became evil no he was deity while he was crucified on the cross he was still deity but deity was carrying the sins of humanity deity was uh, and deity was being nailed the adamic nature the sinful nature was nailed with him but he was always deity he his nature didn't change he was bearing our sin and our sinful nature was being crucified with him is it okay like i hope i made it clear yes pastor thank you very much okay okay thank you divya's question my last question 
So through Jesus Christ, we have been restored to the same status as Adam and Eve when they were first created, or is the restoration through Jesus Christ, is it more than that? Mm -hmm. So Divya, the answer to your question is, it is more than what Adam had, Adam and Eve had. Why do I say that? Because uh, Adam and Eve were created as children of God. We see that Luke chapter 3, verse 38, it says Adam was a son of God, he was created as a child of God. But nowhere does it say that Adam was seated at the right hand of God. We don't, we don't see that. But when we come to the new creation, we see not only are we born again into God's family to become his sons and daughters, which Adam and Eve were, were in the beginning, but he takes us and he makes us sit with him in Christ. Which puts us in a place far higher than what Adam had. So the answer to your question is, it's much more than what Adam had. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right, our time is up. Uh, we have to all hurry to our uh, next class. But what I want to just request is uh, somebody could just uh, say a line or two.